My name is Jason Richardson. I'm the Director of Research for the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. I want to thank you all for joining us to talk about redlining and um, redlining and public health and our new report that was released in September on uh, redlining public health and COVID-19 vulnerability. As a part of that report, we also enlisted help from some friends to develop a series of blog posts that we've been releasing every week or so since the report came out. And we're very happy to be joined today by two of those writers. Um, and they're gonna come, you know, speak in a few minutes and talk about their experiences with redlining and neighborhood health in their areas of operation. Uh, in order today, we're gonna have Dr. Bruce Mitchell, who's the primary author on the report. He's our senior researcher, talk about the major findings and methodology. Then Janet Levy, our GIS specialist, is gonna share the web application that was developed uh, for this project by the University of Richmond, and he'll walk through how to use that. I'm also gonna share a link in the chat uh, to those, uh, I'm gonna share a link in the chat to those tools so you can follow along at home or, or go back later and explore the data in more detail. Following that, Ruhi Maker of Empire Justice Center is gonna talk about uh, Rochester, New York, and then Marceline White, the executive director of the Maryland Consumer Rights Coalition, will be talking about Baltimore and talking about data there. Following that, we're going to have a, a good amount of time for a, for a Q&A. So go ahead and think about your questions. And if you want to, there should be a Q&A box at the bottom. You can put them in in advance or put them in the chat, and I will try to keep track of them. And we'll get to as many as we can after the, uh, the panelists are done speaking. OK, with that, I'm going to ask Bruce Mitchell to please share his screen and unmute his mic and take it away. Thanks so much, Jason. So this project, Redlining and COVID-19 Risk Factors, um, this is a joint project between NCRC and uh, University of Wisconsin Joseph Zilber School of Public Health. We also worked with the University of Richmond to produce a really nifty visualization where you can look at the actual redlining maps and see what the current public health effects are in different communities, 142 cities throughout the United States. So when we began thinking about this project early on, um, sorry about that. We looked at these HOLC maps, right? And here we have the HOLC map, redlining map of Richmond, Virginia. And this was produced back in 1937. And you can see this coding that was made on these maps with the green areas being the best areas for the examiners, blue being desirable areas, yellow areas of decline. And then the red areas are the hazardous areas. And what this map is doing, it's looking at and evaluating mortgage risk throughout the city of Richmond, according to the examiners who used a really standardized form at that time, which took into account a lot of factors for the city, like property values, site and situation of the housing, whether it was close to, say, industrial uses or nuisances uh, for the neighborhood. But a big part of their evaluation was the race, nationality, and the social class of the people who lived in a neighborhood. This was a big factor. And invariably you find in areas that had any presence of African-Americans that those areas were downgraded to the lowest rating, which is hazardous. So if you look at this map, I think the thing that really struck us early on in this project was the large differences in life expectancy within cities. In Richmond, Virginia, there's a green shaded area near Windsor Farms on the west side of the town, and that's highlighted here. That area, it has a life expectancy of 84 years today. And this is in contrast with a black neighborhood of Church Hill, which is only five miles distance from Windsor Farms. And that has a life expectancy at birth of only 66 years. So this five mile difference in distance makes a 18 year difference in life expectancy within Richmond. And when we looked at the old HOLC maps, we noticed over and over again that this was a pattern, that the red line hazardous areas had generally a lower life expectancy at birth compared to the green shaded best areas. And you gotta remember this was done 80 years ago by examiner. So this is a 
persisting pattern that we're seeing. Around that time, the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic started becoming apparent. And we started seeing stories and research about how minorities and low-income communities were being particularly hard hit by COVID-19, that rates of mortality, rates of morbidity were higher for Black and Hispanic communities oftentimes than white communities. And there was this report in the New York Times. They published a piece about this and how this is a continuation of long-standing racial disparities in health with a gap in death rates that goes all the way back to the Jim Crow era. And in this current pandemic, there are several factors which make African-American communities more vulnerable, right? One of those is that African-Americans tend to be a larger share of the frontline service workers in communities. That African-Americans often have more crowded living conditions, greater exposure to air pollution, greater likelihood of being uninsured, and also there are lower percentages of physicians relative to the population share for African-Americans. So all these factors come into this increased exposure or social vulnerability for um, COVID-19. And this is an aspect of structural racism. And we start thinking about the redlining maps and how they've contributed to a persisting structure of racism in American cities. So what do we mean by structural racism? And this is the totality of ways that societies foster discrimination through mutually reinforcing and inequitable systems. And these are systems in housing that we're particularly interested in NCRC, right? In education, in employment, earnings, benefits, credit availability, the media, healthcare, criminal justice, and so on. And these are self-reinforcing discriminatory beliefs and values. And they affect the distri distribution of resources, which together affect the risk of adverse health incomes in communities. And you can think about this in terms of health pathways. This is a public health perspective, which links aspects of say neighborhoods and the way people live with their current health outcomes. And in this, this is a historical timeline going back to the early part of the 20th century when you had government policies and social structures that imposed segregation and redlining on communities. These in turn set neighborhood trajectories of investment and disinvestment, creating a structure of residential seg segregation in home ownership. This allocated place-based place resources, which would contribute to things for a healthy lifestyle. For instance, environmental pollution, what was approximated environmental pollution, transportation, employment, education, healthcare, access to food stores. You've heard of food deserts. That's one aspect of this. Banking, social services, parks and recreation. So this sort of inequitable structure that was consistent really then affected how people were exposed, right? Exposures to and access to healthcare uh, within communities. And we see this in current health outcomes during our study period, which ended in 2019. Inequities in health outcomes relating to life expectancy, which we talked about, mental health, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and rates of cancer. So how did we do this analysis of these old HOL series and contemporary um, health outcomes? And what we find here, uh, we started working with uh, the researchers at University of Wisconsin who had developed a historical redlining score. And that provided a way to look at the old HULC maps and assess graded neighborhoods so they could be compared with current social, economic, and health data uh, from today. So here we have an example from St. Louis. And on the left panel, you see what were the original HULC grades within neighborhoods. The green graded areas being the highest, uh, uh, best areas, and the uh, yellow graded areas being the hazardous areas. So when we applied this historical redlining score, you see that in the right-hand panel, how that would fall out uh, in our mapping of different communities. 
Our objectives in this study were to first off determine if redlining is related to COVID-19 risk factors, then to look at redlining segregation disinvestment, which not only reduced minority wealth, but possibly impacted health and longevity, resulting in a legacy of chronic disease, premature death in many minority neighborhoods. In this study, it's one of the first, uh, it's the first national study I'm aware of that looks at present day neighborhood health outcomes and compares those to the old redlining maps. So we looked at these different aspects of public health, the average lifespan, hypertension, rates of asthma, mental health, cholesterol levels, diabetes, kidney disease, obesity, and stroke. And here's an example of St. Louis of how this mapping would play out and how you would look at uh, St. Louis. So in the top left-hand panel, you have uh, the original HULC mapping of St. Louis showing this division of neighborhoods by gradings. Directly to the right of that is how this worked out in terms of the historical redlining scores. Then the panels below, the one to the left is life expectancy with the darker shaded areas being areas of higher life expectancy. And you could see that particularly in the southern portion of St. Louis, that many of these neighborhoods had much higher life expectancy that were higher graded, that were the green and blue graded areas by Chelsea examiners, while the areas that were redlined have lower life expectancy generally. This also works out in a greater social vulnerability, and that's in the panel to the lower right. Social vulnerability, what that is, that's the susceptibility of a community to um, greater risk from say disasters or a pandemic, for instance, like the COVID-19 pandemic. So these areas that are darker shaded in brown, they have much higher social vulnerability or susceptibility um, to disasters. And when we looked at these across a broad range of different health effects, what we found was nationally in every one of these categories, the most redlined areas had much higher susceptibility, right? Uh, they had much uh, lower life expectancy, worse outcomes with, with mental health, worse asthma rates, higher cholesterol, worse rates of COPD, diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease, obesity, and stroke. So it's right across the board. Areas with greater redlining had worse public health outcomes. Additionally, they were areas which had higher per percentages of minorities, higher uh, poverty levels, and greater social vulnerability. So this is across the country that we find these worst outcomes for areas that had greater redlining. So what does this tell us? First off, it tells us that redlining is directly related to adverse health outcomes, that higher rates of asthma, COPD, kidney disease, all those health uh, uh, factors which we discussed, that they're worse in redlined areas, that life expectancy is reduced in redlined tracks, that lower uh, redlining levels has lower rates of poverty, only 14% on average, and a higher life expectancy of 79.4 years on average versus higher redlining areas that have 28% poverty on average and a reduced 75 year uh, average life expectancy. Additionally, redlining is associated with pre existing conditions that heighten the risk of morbidity and mortality from COVID 19, things like hypertension, diabetes, and obesity and that the relationship of greater redlining with adverse neighborhood um, uh, level of risk is an example of structural racism in America's urban areas. So the key takeaways from this are that first off, redlining imposed segregation, creating neighborhoods of concentrated disadvantage in neighborhood city, in American cities. Second, the redlining is related to higher rates of poverty today. It's related to greater exposure for environmental health hazards. Uh, redlining is linked to poor health outcomes and increased morbidity due to COVID-19 through several potential pathways. And finally, that these findings are consistent with analysis, other analysis that's documented structural racism and historic redlining as determinants of racial and economic health um, uh, disparities. 
The impact of redlining has been its concentrated disadvantage and limited opportunity in many communities and created poor health outcomes today. This has made many black communities particularly vulnerable to disasters like COVID-19 pandemic that we're dealing with today. And thank you very much. Our next presenter, I think, uh, is that uh, Rui, Jason? Well, Jad's gonna come on first and he's gonna talk about the web application. And, Very good. Uh, this is the web application we developed with uh, University of Richmond. That right. should be very interesting. Thank you. Right. So thank you, Bruce. Uh, there are a couple questions in the, in the chat about, or in the Q&A box about methodology. We're gonna address those questions at the end when all the speakers have had a chance to go. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I see you there, just don't worry about it. Or we will get back to you. Uh, just a quick note as uh, Jad gets ready to share his screen. The, uh, <clears throat> what was kind of surprising to us, first of all, we began this report in late 2019. So COVID was not an issue at the time. And working with the epidemiologist partner at University of Wisconsin, as COVID pandemic kind of exploded onto the, the, uh, the, uh, the world, we realized that a lot of the outcomes we were looking at were related to the severity of COVID. Um, so it was, uh, it, it didn't start off uh, as a COVID focused report, but, um, but you know, we, we found that there was a lot of relationship between the, the uh, outcomes we were looking at and what was going on. So uh, I think if Jad's ready, he's gonna go ahead and share his screen. Now, I put a link in the chat to the report itself. And if you go there, there's a, uh, you can scroll down, there's a button that'll take you to the maps and you can, you can oh, he's gonna take us through it right now. Take it away, Jad. Uh, thank you, Jason. Uh, and thank you, Bruce, for going through that. Um, I'd like to also thank our partners, uh, Rob Nelson, Justin Madron, and their team at the University of Richmond for spearheading uh, the design of the web application. And uh, also, as Jason said, any questions you may have, please submit them in the Q&A box. Um, so uh, the web application is pretty easy to access. Uh, on our reports page, we can find a link that connects us to our maps and data if we scroll down a little bit right over here. It swooshes you all the way down to the bottom of the page and uh, gives you a list to choose from. Uh, so although uh, for those who are familiar with mapping uh, uh, inequality, which is one of UR's other projects that gained a lot of steam uh, before this, uh, this tool is similar in that it shows the residential security maps uh, designed by this HULC in the 1930s. But it is different because it compares these maps to the current status of public health in each neighborhood within the, within the list of cities. So for relevance, I will take a look at Rochester, New York, which could be found by state here. And all we got to do is click here. Leads to a different tab and shows uh, the web application. So on the left, you'll see the old HOLC maps. And on the right, you'll see a social vulnerability index broken down by census tract, um, SVI for short. The SVI is an index developed by the CDC, which measures a neighborhood's vulnerability to disasters such as economic recessions, natural disasters, and in this case, pandemics. Uh, green colors show lower uh, SVI values, while the red magenta colors, um, the red magenta colors show higher values. Uh, to make it simpler, red is bad and shows particularly vulnerable neighborhoods to major issues such as COVID-19. Um, in the middle here, you have the breakdown of how each uh, neighborhood transitioned from the 1930s to uh, uh, current measurements. And uh, uh, these are measurements as of 2018. Uh, so let's take a look at, uh, at a neighborhood that's uh, on particularly on the red side. Um, so I'm going to just go ahead and click on one right here. So when you click on these on one of these census tracts, it actually gives you the breakdown of how of uh, which uh, HOLC graded area it applied to and uh, how it actually translated into what is now uh, its uh, its SVI score. Um, so in the, in the middle section, you'll see a breakdown of the HOLC notes at the top. And uh, warning, uh, there is there's probably going to be some language that we uh, do not say nowadays. And uh, it's, definitely, uh, it's definitely a trigger warning for, uh, for how, uh, anyways. Uh, 
the current spread of demographic measurements are also shown here, um, uh, including uh, life expectancy, social vulnerability, minority percentage, uh, median age, and uh, over 65 and poverty. And if you notice on all of these, particularly, they're all showing red, um, which uh, kind of factored into the uh, overall percentages of what was determined in the SVI. Um, if you scroll down further, you'll see the public health variables that were measured from uh, the uh, from our study, uh, including asthma, cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure, kidney disease, mental health problems, obesity, and uh, COPD. Uh, the track selected is what is highlighted in the selection, and uh, it is a clear. Uh, uh, you can clearly see um, the uh, the start reminders of why this neighborhood is what it is at currently. Uh, but in contrast, uh, I'd like to also uh, show a neighborhood that's only about two miles away from this census tract. And it's in what we, what this is identifying as the Cobbs Hill neighborhood. And uh, in this neighborhood, uh, you have a very different health outlook. And once we click on that, you will see that it's on the very low end of the social vulnerability spectrum. And uh, with that, a percent minority is also much lower, uh, life expectancy a lot higher, um, 81.2, and uh, median age uh, is relatively higher and it's on the highest end, um, over 65 as well high. Um, basically everything that you will see here is likely going to be in the green. And, um, this is only a seven minute drive from this, uh, from this other neighborhood right outside the downtown loop of Rochester. Um, this was just a quick breakdown of the web tool, but you can easily see what uh, the remarks that were made in uh, from the HOLC um, uh, analysis of these neighborhoods at the time. Uh, these are lengthy and uh, could also be expanded upon by accessing University of Richmond's mapping inequality project uh, by just uh, clicking the link over here. Um, at this point, uh, I'd like to hand it over to Rui, uh, who will be diving into uh, Rochester's uh, case and uh, how it impacted the city based on experiences there. Rui? Hi, so um, my name is Ruhi Maker. I am an attorney at the Empire Justice Center uh, in Rochester, New York. Uh, we're a statewide agency. Uh, we have offices in Albany. Um, White Plains, Yonkers, and Long Island. So we're all of New York except New York City. Just that's how New York works out. The way we do provide, you know, free legal services. So I'm a public interest lawyer. I started my career as a housing attorney. I represented tenants in um, public and subsidized and even private housing. And then um, uh, about in the early 90s, um, it became really clear that there, weren't, there wasn't enough affordable housing. And what were we gonna do about it? And right around that time, um, CRA, it, uh, CRA regulations were revised by President Clinton. And we essentially uh, made a coalition, uh, the Greater Rochester Community Reinvestment Coalition which had many not-for-profits doing direct service work, you know, affordable housing work, all sorts of work um, in, this, in the city of Rochester and then beyond. So the very first thing we did, and you know, unfortunately it's, I've only got 15 minutes, so I'm gonna try and be coherent and make these points. But a lot of what I say and talk about, we just did a CRA exam comment letter. And a lot of the things that I'm gonna say are in that letter and we'll figure out a way to put it on our website and get it to you. So we formed the Greater Rochester Community Reinvestment Coalition. And, and for those of you who are CRA advocates and who know what we do, um, the federal regulators examine banks every three, four, five years, depending on the size of the bank. And um, banks have merged. I mean, it's kind of stopped right now, but for many, many years, banks merged. And so every time there was a CRA exam or every time there was a bank merger, we looked at data. So 1992, um, you got your Humda data in you know, a huge stack of paper and you essentially hand colored in the maps. And the very first report that we did that I did with my original co-convener, uh, Melissa Marquez, who is, uh, runs this community development financial institution in Rochester. She was my original co-convener. And what we saw was that 
if you are a low income white person, and it's a little hard because the demographics have changed. Um, if you're a low income white person in the Northwest of Rochester, you are four times more likely to get a home mortgage loan than a middle income black person. So a poor, a poorer white person was four times more likely to get a home mortgage loan loan than uh, than a black person. I mean, since then, a lot of Latinx have moved into the into the neighborhoods. So essentially, what we did, we we made maps. I mean, and our maps, red line maps, look like the map th that you see. And we would repeatedly see that the maps there were no loans, and we would do it for all financial institutions, and we'd do it for individual banks. And we would basically say, okay, you've got no loans here, or someone else is lending here. I mean, at that time, remember, it's all mostly banks and credit unions who are lending. You don't have the quickens of the world and you don't have all these different mortgage banks lending. So we would essentially say, you've got to lend and we would look at the data and we would essentially also look at denial data. So that's sort of a lot of what we did for a long time. And, and you know, we still continue to do that. So if you were to go back to, um, you know, this is, you know, not in the 90s, we like I'm going to give you the example of a, a, a single mom who's a home health aide who works at, you know, at, at the hospital down the street from one of those neighborhoods that you saw. And if she were making twenty five thousand dollars a year, you know, she maybe had gone to community college, we could actually put her into a mortgage and she would actually be making paying less in a mortgage and taxes and in a better house than if she were a tenant because our rents have always been disproportionately high. It's always been more expensive to be a tenant in Rochester than if we can get into, into home ownership. So how do we do that? Essentially down payment assistance, state, city, bank programs where you do pre-foreclosure, you do pre-purchase counseling, post-purchase counseling, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, you've got all of these folks with equity. And then of course, we all know subprime crisis. I'm a foreclosure lawyer as well. I've been you know, representing homeowners in foreclosure back to the 2000 was my first client that I did my first loan mod. And so that we spent a lot of time essentially putting in place lots of laws and regulations and programs in New York, where if you're in foreclosure, you know, you, you, you essentially get lots of legal options and it takes a very, very long time. And we put a lot of things in place. So now let's fast forward to um, 2016. So remember, when I'm when I'm back in the 90s, I can essentially have someone who is making a minimum wage, I can turn her into a homeowner. And eventually she's, you know, assuming she's in, you know, get ripped off by uh, by a by a prairie lender, you know, she's building assets and wealth. And then um, the next thing is we also were pushing for acquisition rehab, new construction of homes. Uh, that were then sold to, you know, very low income minority families, et cetera, in the city. So we all, all of those, there's a lot of, you know, cause you've got home mortgage lending and then you've got community development investment and grants. So that also we were very focused on where is community development investments and grants? What are the services that are going to low income people? And again, it's a whole coalition. Everyone comes in, says, this is what I want. This is what I don't want. And we essentially, you know, as a community decide what's needed and the not-for-profits who work, you know, are, are, are asked for these things and we in work, support them in getting them and et cetera. So now I wanna kind of fast forward to 2016. So what happens is suddenly the Fed starts to realize that, oh, most of the country doesn't have $400 to meet an emergency. And, 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 and the Fed can buy huge amounts of data. In this case, I'm talking about the New York Fed. So the New York Fed uh, buys the data and they, sh and they do this for the whole country. They show what percentage of the population is essentially subprime because what's happened now, you've got income inequality. If you, you know, if let's assume you're a minimum wage. Now your minimum wage, you're not paying all your bills on time. You know, you can't pay your rent. You can't pay your childcare. If you have any student loans from community college, you, it doesn't matter. You can work two or three jobs now and you still can't pay all your bills. And, you know, we in legal services and, of course, all the CRA advocates, we know that. So what are the banks saying? They say, oh, let's teach you financial literacy. No, you don't get it. 
you can make if you're on the minimum wage and you're a mom or a dad and you've got a kid or even if you're just by yourself we don't pay enough to pay housing costs too much education costs too much healthcare costs too much car payments cost too much so so we essentially come up with oh it's not so bad in the rochester msa monroe county msa no i want to see this data at the census track level we would have liked it at the block level but and that's a very important thing as you're doing this work you know when you look at data at the national level the state level the regional level data can look very good what you and we knew this from foreclosure because you'd map the foreclosures you zero in on black and brown neighborhoods and when you zero in on black and brown neighborhoods what we found and which we did actually was even worse than i thought that 53 percent of the city of rochester was subprime and that the black and brown neighborhoods the red line you know the red the neighborhoods where there wasn't a lot of lending was they were up to 75 percent of those households were subprime remember we're still the 16 we're still post recession and so over time, we're like, it's not enough to just say, hey, you know, here's a small business loan. Hey, here's a house. Because you're in such a deep hole and income inequality is so bad, there is no way you can pay your bills and you're never going to get out. So we use that data, the data showing the 50, up to 75% subprime. Uh, we use that to do a report called Too Big to Fail. Because what's happening? You're, you go to the bank and you, you, it doesn't matter, financial literacy doesn't matter, you're essentially ending up with huge overdraft fees. And remember what the banks are doing. They have designed checking accounts to maximize overdraft fees from the poorest of the poor while giving free checking to the people who, who, can, you know, who have disposable income. So we looked at that. And so, so now my pivot, and I'm trying to see how much time I have left, not much, uh, is is so my pivot in a sense has been okay. I want to figure out who is second generation poverty, who is perhaps barely graduating from high school, who has graduated from high school and is the minimum wage, and who is you know one year college or community college or two year community college. Like for me, all of those people in Rochester cannot be homeowners. They cannot go out and start a small business loan. Their credit has been destroyed by predatory capital that has preyed on the poorest of the poor for, you know, to some extent for a very long time, but it's essentially gotten worse. It's like banks, I'm not going to name the banks, but it's like, oh, I don't want to lend to you. You're, you are subprime. But hey, private equity or whoever bad actor, let me give you a facility and give you millions of dollars so you can essentially make bad loans, whether you want to call them payday loans, bad product. So, you know, we have the CFPB and all sorts of good things start happening. Let's not go there. The CFPB, it's Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which I'm very angry and bitter about, is now the Consumer Financial, Financial Industry Protection Bureau. Not only are they not doing what they should be doing, to help consumers. They're actually making the rules worse and worse and worse. And what's really scary is that they're trying to do, get a lot done in the next you know, six weeks or so, or two. They're shoving stuff through. I don't know how we're gonna undo all of that. So now what I'm saying to the banks, what I have been saying to the banks is, what are you doing to help the very low income? You know, So that I'm talking $10,000 a year in income, $20,000 a year in income. $30,000. So I basically say, what are your programs? What, what are your programs? So for those of you who know Rochester, who are from New York, um, not only is that red lined map and that neighborhood that we showed you, that, you know, there's no lending going on or very little lending going on. Uh, mentally ill, black man was murdered by the cops and I, i'm not going to describe what happened it was horrific and you know i used the word white supremacist three years ago to describe some a white organization and i had three half three i've had three years of backlash from having used that term white supremacist because nobody said those words in those days 
And, and I don't know who's on. I can't tell who's on. I, apparently banks are invited to. But the point I've, I've, I, made, I made to a CEO who shall remain nameless, I looked him in the eye before COVID, and I said, and, and this is someone I've known for a long time. I do a lot of work with the banks. So I try and say things, and this is kind of my advice to you. I saw, try and say things that are the hardest things that they can bear to hear, but that they'll invite me back to the table. Because I don't have that luxury. Like if I'm not speaking for my clients, you know, if they kick me out of the room, what, you know, what can I do? So, um, so basically I said, I said, this isn't about economics anymore. And this is before George Floyd was killed and Daniel Poole was killed. This isn't about economics. We have to serve the black and brown communities in New York. They are too large a population for us to just set them aside. So I don't really care. And I've always made that point. I've never made it about morality. I've always made it about economics that'll help everyone and help the community. So when you're a smallish bank and your whole region is upstate New York, I say, if you don't do the right thing, upstate New York will go to, you know, it's a post-industrial city. It will go to hell in a handbasket and your bank will be destroyed. I mean, I literally not exactly those words, but pretty much those words. And one of the things that I found, you know, we were talking about who do you reach out to? You start with the littlest bank and the CEO whose house you can practically, or whatever, a 10 minute, whose CEO lives 10 minutes away from downtown. So that's sort of my kind of, and I appeal to them. And when, you know, within two weeks of COVID, we had, a, we had a call with a couple of CEOs and three of the other banks. And we were like, okay, everything's got to go in forbearance. You cannot collect any debt. And everyone was like, yeah, we got, we're, we're going to put everyone in forbearance. And I have another call later today to figure out, okay, now what are we going to do? We're six months in and how are we going to do forbearance? And there's huge explanation of forbearance and what can happen in our m and exam letter explains all the rights that folks have, you know, who are in mortgages. So, so the thing that I'm now talking about, the latest thing that I'm figuring out a way to say is that if we're going to serve a young teenager who is second or third generation poverty, whose mom was a teen mom, and I'm actually working with an amazing grassroots group of women uh, on, on this, and I have a call about that later today, is it's got to be Black and Latinx designed. Ideally, you have a Black or Latinx CEO. Ideally, you have Black and Latinx attorneys or advocates or senior, senior vice presidents. And if nothing else, the power has to lie in Black and Latinx staff with the lived experience of those communities. You know, the banks, I mean, this is what we've done for 30 years. The banks will come up with a program. You know, very big bank did a really stupid thing. You know, the day after they self-reported themselves, they're talking to their fair lending officer and he was explaining, oh, this is what we did. I said, come on, are you kidding? I mean, I didn't say it like that. I was nice because they were like, oh, we did a really bad thing. Please let us tell you about it. And so, so like, so for 30 years I've been saying, you've got white design solutions for a black and Latinx community. And now the distance between the white CEO and the person who has lived and grown up in a segregated neighborhood is enormous. There is no connection, you know? And for me, even for me as a public interest lawyer for 40 years, I'm like, okay, folks, those of you who talk directly to clients or who are actually working with these clients, I need to understand exactly what you're doing. I need to figure out exactly what you're doing. I need to put it into words that a white funder will understand. And, you know, you're in the streets, you're marching with BLM every day. I got to figure out, well, if you're, if you're marching with BLM every day, I got to make a, 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 you know, bankers still fund your program. I mean, you know, obviously you can't fund for asking, you know, elected officials to resign because that's not covered CRA activity. But so the thing that I'm hoping, and I, you know, I said to that I'm more hopeful. What's interesting is that I, in 2014, were why aren't there people in the streets? You know, this is horrible. I mean, every year I'm like, why aren't there people in the streets? And my time is literally up now, right? So, uh, and 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 the frankly, the bankers are like, oh my God, there's racism in America. There's racism in Rochester. You know, sorry, I shouldn't be making sarcastic noises, but you know, um, it's like yes. And he, I, I, so I need, I want to figure out. Oh, sorry. So what can we remind you? What CRA stands for? Okay, the Community Reinvestment Act requires you 
to lend, to do investments, and to make grants and the, what is the service test in mm -hmm. in 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 all in your all your community. So to go back twenty years, and you know a banker who shall remain nameless was I lend to my community as in. Black and brown people are not in my community and I'm not going to lend to them. So we worked and worked and did you know, exam after exam after exam. And finally, they're one of our top lenders now. You know, they, their numbers are better than anyone else's. So essentially, you know, you're a bank, you get FDIC insurance. If, you know, if when you have losses, the taxpayer pays. When you have profits, you keep them all for yourself. So the Community Reinvestment Act, which was designed to get rid of redlining does not say anything about lending to black and brown people. It talks about low moderate income people. And so what we force the banks have forced the banks to do when we do the math is show no loans there. You have no loans there. And so what are you gonna do and how are we gonna serve that neighborhood? I think Jason is kind of, uh, so essentially, you know, short, I'm gonna write some of this stuff up and I'm hoping there's gonna be a big study about some of this. But we're going to figure out to serve the people who no one else serves. And we're going to only do that when it's black and brown led. And when I say brown, I don't mean South Asian. I'm from Pakistan. I mean, black and Latinx led. That's not enough. Like, I have too much privilege uh, to fully, you know, I can learn things. But I have too much privilege as South Asian, given my personal background. You know, obviously, there are other communities where there are a lot of low income Asians and that in that case it should be Asian led but in Rochester it's black and Latinx led you know we're doing a lot of work with refugees etc and that's where the, it's refugee led it's led from wherever those folks came from and we're doing specific work around those communities but that's pretty much it I mean I think we got to figure out a way that you know we're going to you know why this why this has to happen and that's what we need to do because Rochester has the worst child poverty in the entire country for a city its size. So thank you, uh, NCRC, I've been a member forever. If you're doing racial justice work, not a plug, uh, you know, you really can't do it on your own. You have to have a local coalition, a state coalition, a regional uh, cohorts and a national coalition. I only do this because I work with, you know, amazing people and Barb Van Kirkhoff, who is happily on vacation, was the main co-author, main writer of the report and does all my data. I'm gonna mute myself now before someone else does that. Thanks, Ruhi, <clears throat> excuse me. So there were a couple of questions that were posted that we're gonna to get to at the end of the, uh, after Marceline speaks. And then uh, I also posted a link to our Treasurer CRA page that NCRC has, if you want more information on the Community Reinvestment Act on what it does and, and our work on it. Also, Ruhi touched on a great point about low-income Asian uh, communities, and they are certainly there. They're often overlooked. Earlier this year, NCRC, we published a small report on the Asian American and Pacific Islander community and mortgage lending, along with uh, an Asian uh, group called National Capacity that does a lot of great work on that community. So if you're interested in diving more into that, um, that data, you can uh, email me or, or just uh, do a search on our website and it should pop right up for you. With that, Marceline, I'm going to share my screen and you are free to unmute and get started and just let me know uh, when you want me to uh, to advance the slides. All right, great. Thank you. And Jason, about how long do I have? Uh, 15 minutes. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, again, I want to thank NCRC for their work on preparing this report. I think it's a critically important addition to our conversation about um, race equity and the work we have ahead of us um, and the work that um, has led us to this moment and looking at all of these complex interactions. Um, so my name is Marceline White. I'm the executive director of the Maryland Consumer Rights Coalition, MCRC. And MCRC advances economic rights and equity. And we do that through our own research. We do that through community organizing with neighborhood-based groups. Um, we do that through advocacy at the city, state, and federal level. And we have a direct service and fair housing programs as well that directly help people with financial assistance, tax credits, um, affirmatively furthering for housing and tenant and, and rental eviction pieces. So if you want to share the screen, um, <clears throat> I'll just get started. What I'm hoping to do 
um, in this um, in this slide in this slide show quickly is to really talk about um, redlining and the health disparities in Baltimore in the black butterfly. You can go ahead. So I want to take NCRC's great analysis and really drill down into looking at how this would apply in a city like Baltimore, really kind of um, putting flesh on the broad bones they sketched out nationally to say, what does this really look like when you take that analysis through at a city level? So I'm gonna look at redlining and its impact on economic opportunity, health disparities, the implications of COVID and policy solutions really quickly. So this will be kind of a fast broad based view, but hopefully will um, give you some information to start with as we discuss this. So if you can move forward, please. And thank you again to um, Jason for sharing the screen. Okay, great. So what I wanted to do is I'm just showing you the map in Baltimore. This is the, um, this is our Hulk map and Baltimore really is the kind of ground zero for horrible racial policies. Um, in 1910, the first ordinance was passed on racial zoning. And then in the 1930s, before this map, the Housing Authority of Baltimore ran two separate housing programs, one for white families and another for black families. Then, um, as you can see, um, the Homeowners Loan Corporation created this map in Baltimore, um, which, you know, again, began the practice of redlining. So Baltimore, unfortunately, has a deep and long history of um, developing policies and programs that uphold um, discrimination, um, racial discrimination. And what we're going to talk about going forward is really what the legacy of that discrimination is, what the legacy of those maps made in the 30s have on families living, loving, and um, growing and trying to thrive in Baltimore today, despite many systemic obstacles. So if you can um, just move to the next slide, that would be great. Okay, so um, what I'm talking about now is really just looking at the consequences. So as a result of that redlining map um, that you saw, what that meant is that in the 1930s, black residents who made up 20% of the population were confined to 2% of the city. So really you think about a city where you're making up 20% of the population and you're only able to live in 2% of it. Um, you know, that's, that's the real consequence of the segregation. And then if you move on, like just carrying that through time, um, what that means is in 2000, we saw what's called a dissimilarity index. And there was a study, which I noted here, which just means that Black Baltimore scored a 75.2 dissimilarity, dissimilarity index to white residents, which means in order for Black and white residents to become evenly distributed, 75% of whites would have to move to another neighborhood. And again, that just shows you that these legacy, these legacy lines continue to perpetuate throughout our city and they exacerbate existing inequalities and they deepen this racial wealth gap. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that now, just about what the economic impact is. So if you can go to the next slide, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so if we're looking at the economic impact, and I just kept the map up here just so you know, because I felt like, you know, if I were if I were able, I would just like, I, you know, if we were doing this in person, I would have a pointer and I would show you these different places um, on the map. But the point is in kind of a gallows humor way, activists in Baltimore, and again, the Maryland Consumer Rights Coalition is statewide. We work across the state, but our office is based in Baltimore and we have a particular interest and commitment to working in Baltimore and um, alongside Baltimore activists um, on these issues. But we, we say that all the maps are the same map in Baltimore. Whatever the issue is, if you look at how it plays out and who's most disadvantaged, it's um, residents and communities in the formerly redlined area. And that's where, you know, I just wanna highlight the term, the black butterfly, which Dr. Lawrence Brown, 
who was a professor at Morgan State came up with to really look at, um, if you look at the green lined areas, it's almost a straight line from kind of an L shape from the harbor up through the center of the city all the way up and the east and west of parts of Baltimore are predominantly African American communities and have been predominantly redlined. So when you look at the impacts today, you're still talking about um, negative impacts in, in parts of the black butterfly. So if you're looking at employment, you're looking at the highest level of employment are on parts of the east side of Baltimore, Greenmount East, um, Old Town Middle East, Madison East End. Those are the highest rates of unemployment in the city. If you look at where population is declining, a lot of that is on the east side as well. Um, if you look at areas where you talk about housing, which we'll get to, that's a different part of the city. But if you look at um, where people are rent and mortgage burden, that falls heavily in communities like Sandtown Winchester, um, which was covered in quite in the news quite a bit as a as a result of the Baltimore uprising. If you look at where people are rent burdened, it's Belar Edison, which is a little, a little bit north, but also um, on the east side. So you see again and again um, the way these red lines created this pathway of disinvestment from the community economically and created disinvestment and these other um, factors that play into that. So what we saw is that, you know, there was disinvestment from these communities, um, which meant that you don't have as much money for your housing, which we'll talk about. And it also means it's harder to get the employment's high. It's hard to get to jobs in Baltimore without a car. I believe 40% of people in Baltimore rely on public transportation. The public transportation is abysmal. It's a bus system and a and it's a subway line that goes north and south but doesn't go east and west into the black butterfly it only goes along kind of the white spine along the um path of the butterfly a uh, path of the um kind of the caterpillar part i guess of the butterfly but it doesn't go into the populations where people need transportation to get to jobs which are predominantly outside the city or at the edges of the city so that's one of the reasons for unemployment um population is declining and again, you depend on that for a tax base, you depend on that for people to be engaged, you depend on that for safety. So all of these factors combine. We also have bank deserts. Um, in the Black Butterfly, um, there are very few banks you can get to by walking. And again, um, very few people have transportation. So um, you don't have a lot of banks. I live um, in a little green speck of the, um, kind of West Baltimore and the Black Butterfly. Um, but I can walk, it's about a mile, maybe a mile and a half to Sandtown Winchester, which was the site of the uprising um, for justice after the death of Mr. Freddie Gray. There are no banks um, in that walk. There, all you see are pawn shops and alternative financial um, places. Conversely, in the green part of the city, in Roland Park is one area, um, you can see three banks side by side by side, all next to each other in, um, in a line um, in this very prosperous part of the city. And when you look at some of the major financial institutions and you look where they're closing down bank branches, we did a report and we um, organized people to write a letter to the bank. A major financial bank closed bank branches, but only in majority Black neighborhoods, even those of the Sprank branches were consistently making more and more money each year. Um, and they would say, well, you know, there's another bank, there's another bank like two miles away. Well, if you're an elderly single woman uh, without access to transportation, that doesn't really help you much. Um, these are the same places along with bank deserts. We've talked, you know, there are food deserts. So very few places to get healthy food and a full flight, a full range of food, but they're also what are called food swamps in East and West Baltimore. And what, what that means are basically the term is where you can get fast food. So lots of fast food restaurants, lots of unhealthy options, very few healthy, affordable, full um, grocers. Um, and just in terms of the economic impact, Raj Chetty um, is a Harvard economist 
and he did a study looking at the impact of place on location on economic mobility and really talks about zip code as destiny. So where you're born should not determine the rest of your life. But he looked at the study and found that in some places, um, it really makes a huge difference. And out of 100 locations, Baltimore came in last. Um, what that means is really, um, if you are a young person, a young boy growing up in Baltimore in a low-income family, Baltimore acts almost as a gravity well, kind of pulling you down. Your earnings would fall, this is on average in the study. The study found that the earnings would fall um, by 1.5% every year that um, the young boy stayed in that location. And that means that a 26 year old man growing up in Baltimore would earn about 28% less than a 26 year old man who grew up in another area. Um, so that just talks about again, the long-term legacy of this redlining these maps on um, you know, exacerbating and deepening the, the racial wealth gap. So we'll just talk about health consequences. If you can just advance the, um, if you can advance the map, please. Thank you. Um, again, I talked a little bit about disinvestment of banks already. I also would just want to note. So again, like Ruhi, we work on community reinvestment, um, and we engage with. There's a reinvest Baltimore coalition of neighborhood organizations who've come together to try to work to get the banks to invest in these communities that have been disinvested in for 10, 20, 30, 60 years. Um, so we still can do these, this analysis and we work with NCRC to look at home denial rates, um, both for mortgage lending and small business lending. And we see time and time again, despite all the good work we've all done, there are still these denial rates that um, fall heavy, heaviest on black borrowers and on, um, on majority black communities. Um, in the same way you see that kind of business disinvestment. So in the same way you'll see um, banks are not lending in majority black communities or to majority black borrowers. And so what that means um, is again, um, you see different home prices for very similar homes. There have been reports on this. They found like a $48,000 difference in very similar homes, one that's in a majority white community, one that's in a majority black community. So again, when you think about um, building up income and you think about intergenerational wealth and passing wealth down, um, this is another legacy of this redlining. Um, majority black homes, which are concentrated in Baltimore in the black and white butterfly, um, get less, you know, you, you get less from them, even though they're very similar to a home a mile away. Um, so um, again, if you want to look, you can look at vacants and poor, and poor housing. And what I mean by that is that um, the, the Baltimore City has also been very responsible for ignoring certain homes. So there are a number of vacant houses and houses that are important to dilapidated conditions in um, Baltimore City. And you know the condition of the housing, the housing stock and the built environment, um, which again um, focuses, the vacants are congregated in the black and black butterfly in East and West Baltimore. And again, that's why we say all the maps are the same. Those are where the vacants are. There are not vacants in um, the white majority communities because it, and I think my time is almost up because it means a lot. So I'll just like move quickly through the next ones. Um, sorry, Jason, if you can just move to the health consequences. Um, great. So just to briefly talk, just to briefly mention these pathways, I, I want to respect the time. When you have the vacants, um, these vacant houses, you have um, mouse infestations, you have mouse infestations in low income communities that are not repaired or investigated because the people who may be living in the communities don't have, maybe have the wealth to take care of it and the city is not um, paying as much attention. So you have this particular, so you have 17% higher asthma rates in low income communities in Baltimore than in other parts. Um, when you knock down vacants, the particulate matter comes up in the air and you have uh, more congestion, which again contributes to asthma and lung problems. Um, lead paint uh, is again a problem in, um, in the black butterfly. 
um, even though we are not supposed to have it, there's been lax enforcement and that leads to learning disabilities, impulsivity, high blood pressure, ADHD, which again contributes to education and the ability for, and mobility. So you're directly relates to the income and earnings and there's less tree canopy. Again, um, you can see that, but what that means is there's a 20, 20 year gap in life expectancy, exactly what um, Bruce found in the national results. So um, if you can just go to the next health impacts. Um, the food swamps I talked to um, lead to obesity because people don't have access to healthy food, which is one of the conditions that, you know, is sort of comorbid, comorbid with COVID. The same with um, asthma, it's also comorbid. And again, that's part of the built environment. Um, that's a legacy of this redlining. The higher stress that people experience, both living in communities that have lack of transportation, less economic opportunity, et cetera, leads to changes in the gene, which genes, which makes you more susceptible to, um, um, or less resistant in terms of health and fighting off disease. So I'm not gonna, if you just go to COVID-19, um, I'm not gonna focus on this right now. It, it basically parallels um, what Bruce had said, but in Baltimore, um, you know, what we found is that in Maryland, um, overall, um, Black Marylanders are comprised 42% of the COVID deaths, even though they're 30% of the population. So they're disproportionately um, overrepresented in terms of the number of people dying of COVID because of all of these other factors, because they are more likely to be essential workers. Um, you know, looking at COVID, you also look at the fact that Black businesses, um, were not given the same kinds of loans in Baltimore City um, as white businesses. So again, small black entrepreneurs do not have the same assistance and support to continue in light of COVID um, and that affects their families and those who are working for them. Um, if you just go quickly to policy recommendations, I'll wrap it up. Um, you know, we work again at the federal, state and local level. Um, so we're pushing for a lot of things. I co-chair Attorney General Frosch's task force on COVID-19. I co-chair the Consumer Protection uh, Committee. We're looking at a number of policy recommendations related to um, debt collection and easing restrictions on debt collection. We also, I, I have a staff person who is on the housing committee looking a lot at rental assistance and foreclosure issues. Um, I'm not gonna go into all those recommendations right now, but one of the things we've looked at and talked about is an idea of procurement in Baltimore City. One bank holds all of Baltimore City's money, and it's not clear to me at all that they're the bank that does the most for majority for majority black neighborhoods in terms of lending and business lending. And I think we should be demanding reports from banks about um, about their lending patterns and their small business lending patterns. And then the city should make its procurement decisions based on who is doing the best to incentivize the kinds of investment we wanna see in the city. Um, we also have a owner's practice of hospitals in Baltimore city suing low-income patients. Again, majority patients in the black butterfly for debts under $5,000. And we do not believe you should lose your house, home or car because um, you went to the hospital because you were ill. And um, we think there needs to be a real need and we're trying to do this with Reinvest Baltimore, but need more voices, more, more help, more people to engage on um, coming together across the city um, to push the city leaders and to articulate ourselves locally owned community-based visions for economic development, and then push our city leaders to implement those visions. Um, because very much so in the past, Baltimore has seemed not to have a cohesive vision. It's taken um, development the vision of developers and um, supported that instead of the visions of local community residents. So I'll leave it there and happy to answer any questions. My information is on the next slide so you can get in touch with me later as well. Thank, Thank you, you. Marceline. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks, Marceline. Thank you, Ruhi. Those were great. Um, let me just get out of this. And I've also posted the um, information in the chat uh, for, for email addresses for all of the speakers. So feel free to reach out to them individually. I wanna look at questions here. We still have about 20 minutes left and I wanted to get to some of the questions. Um, a couple of them, Becca and Alex asked very technical questions about the, the um, 
about the methodology used in the report. Um, I'd encourage you to email Bruce Mitchell or Jadid Levy directly, and I put the link in the chat, but I'll, I'll put their uh, emails in the chat again for you, and then they can answer those in, uh, in, in longer form because they're both pretty involved questions. Um, I'm going to start with one of the questions here that I really like, and then I'm going to, uh, I've got a couple that are good for Ruby and Marceline as well. But um, somebody asked who initially started redlining neighborhoods? Was it a government program or a private bank program? Uh, so the HOLC went into neighborhoods during the depression to, to map them in order to, to, uh, to inform the government on the, the, on the um, default risk for loans that they wanted to purchase from banks. And uh, they, they did that, when doing so, they found segregation that was already in place. They had, uh, you know, uh, populations, especially uh, African-Americans, which were typically confined to certain areas of the city, either by practice or by local law. HOLC had the effect, though, of essentially codifying the, that segregation and reinforcing it by encouraging banks not to lend in redlined areas. And they did that by, uh, you know, by making it clear that they weren't going to buy loans in redlined areas. So from a bank's point of view, a loan to a redlined area was a lot more dangerous. Not only was it probably going to be a loan with a higher risk of default, according to them, they also knew that they would not be able to sell that loan. They would have to hold it on portfolio. And that's a, that's a lot of additional risk for banks. So the segregation existed. Uh, the federal policy amplified it. And, and um, you know, essentially uh, trapped it in amber uh, for the next 40 years until it, it was eventually made illegal in the late 1960s to, uh, to redline neighborhoods in this way. And we still see these patterns, re you know, repeating today across health, housing, um, a host of other factors. Marceline touched on food deserts and food swamps. Um, you know, Ruby noted the, the incidence of violence in these areas, uh, police violence. So all of these things uh, kind of follow the similar patterns that were, that were um, you know, essentially reinforced by government policy. Uh, let me see here. There was a great question I thought here for uh, Ruhi, but uh, Marceline, you can jump in also if you want to. I think, I think it has relevance for you from Annette. She asked, how do we balance organizations that want to battle system change against needing to ask for funding from that very system? Does one of you want to take that? Ruhi, you're, mu you're muted. Ruhi, you're muted. I can, I can start if you want while Ruhi unmutes. Yeah. Um, I mean, we deal with this all the time, and I think you know NCRC and other national groups. I know um, it's it's a line, right? But um, for us, we do take funding from banks and financial institutions and others that we also um, disagree with strongly. I think for us, um, you know, because of CRA, they there are certain things they do need to fund, first of all, and part of that is engaging people in CRA related activities. But for us, you know, um, we, you know, our through line, our mission is to advocate for systemic change. That's basically why MCRC was created was to adv advocate for policies that are systemic. So, I mean, I think if push came to shove, we just wouldn't take the funding, we would look for it elsewhere. But um, we're also smaller and we've not been able to grow as quickly because um, sometimes people don't like the things we say. And that the result of that is that we cannot always grow as quickly as we would like because um, it's easier to get some funding for our direct service work than it is for our advocacy work. But I think also as we have more programs, we're able to get support for certain pieces of our work, um, which allows us um, then to, you know, seek different sources of funding for the other pieces. So, so I was lucky in that when I started doing CRA work, I worked for an LSC Legal Services Corporation organization we got you know this big chunk of money from dc and and um so we take get very little bank funding i mean i would say it's like you know we are a multi-million dollar not legal services organized we're not legal services because we're unrestricted we can do things that legal services can't so we get a tiny amount and usually it's what happens is someone calls me up says hey i want to give you money tell me what you want to do so, you know, for we were recently, so the latest thing that I want to work on is cars. In Rochester and probably other parts of the country, the jobs aren't where the, where the housing is. And to get there, you get to, you have to take cars. Uh, cars are horribly unregulated. Car dealers are very, very powerful. 
and you're essentially getting a bad used car loan because you're subprime and that is probably destroying your credit for 10 plus years and you get a bad one and then another bad one, basically the car. So that's one thing I really, really want to work on. I have no idea. I'm going to you know, try and figure out funding. Um, but we like, for example, one of the reports we did, actually small business lending report, uh, we got a grant, it was not a big grant, you know, 25,000, then we got money to do an event. And, you know, we talked about, we had black, you know, black business owners come and talk about what it's like for them as black women and black business owners to walk into a bank and how they get treated. And all the bankers were there. And one of my, you know, I know that NCRC has done some great mystery shopping. And one of the things I try and say to the banks, hey, here's what it's like. I mean, I actually had a advocate who's Latinx who explained what it was like for her to walk into a bank, which was all white. And another one where, where there was a person of color and, 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 you know, we describe it really, really nicely. And so, you know, right now, the problem is with COVID, you've got so many people in crisis, you know, New York is enormously hit. So there's a whole post COVID pivot that I have to say, I've got to start talking to a bank and say, okay, what are we going to do to fix it? And see if he'll agree to it. And the CEO will agree to it and then go to the next bank and the next bank. So it's, you know, sometimes we can do it all together, but you know, everything that Marceline said is true in Rochester. Same thing, uh, we do have had a very amazing lead, you know, lead solution with kids. We've done that for 20 plus years. We have one of the best, um, but um, it's, um, you know, you have to basically, you, you have to ask for the money, speak truth to power, and I somehow am polite to the financial. I mean, I mean, I find that I'm usually the most kick-ass. Sorry, I'm not allowed to say that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I will often say some of the toughest things in a meeting, national meeting. But I, I try, I, I don't demonize people. I basically say, I know you're a good person. And I know you want to do the right thing. And let's do it. And let's help you serve our communities, our poorest of the poor. We can serve our poorest of the poor and it's good for all of us. Now, it doesn't always work. I mean, you can't, you know, big bank with headquarters not near Rochester or New York City. Well, I mean, you know, they, it, it, we just, we, we, it's like, you gotta do, what's good, what am I gonna do today? What am I gonna do tomorrow? You know, it's like you do the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. We can't really plan for November because we don't know what's going to happen and what who's going to be running what. So you just have to pivot. You have to pivot for foreclosure crisis, subprime crisis, you know, COVID. And you're like, what's the data? Get the data. What's happening in the ground? Have relationships with people who can tell you what's happening on the ground. And, you know, the policies aren't really that hard. I mean, some of these things we're talking about for 20 years, nobody wanted to listen. And you just do it. So um, I think you just, I think it's hard, but you know. So that was great. Um, a couple of things real quick. Uh, I cut off Marceline's last slide with her email address. So I've put her email address in the chat. I know a couple of people had asked for it. So it's right there. And if anybody wants uh, slides um, or, or a contact information, just let us know and I can connect you with any of the speakers that you want to uh, want to speak with. There's a couple more questions uh, that were put in the chat that are somewhat related. I'm going to try to kind of answer them together, and then I'm going to, you know, see if any of the other presenters want to want to weigh in. Um, but one 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 uh, questioner asked: uh, Redlining and the consequences have existed for years. Do we dismantle existing systems? What new systems would we create? And can we repair a foundation that is rotten with systemic racism? And then a another. Uh, person mentioned Ruhi's point on we can no longer have a white design solution for black and Latinx people. What would some truly radical black and brown led solutions look like for the, for black and brown communities? So I, I'm going to shamelessly plug NCRC's uh, policy at this point, which, which is uh, to, to support and expand the Community Reinvestment Act. And it's an important time right now because there is a rulemaking in progress right now to uh, revise or expand the CRA or possibly reverse some of the advances, depending on how this comes out. You can go to the Treasure CRA website. I put a link in the chat, but I'll do so again, or, um, or if, if somebody could put it in there for me, I'd appreciate it. 
So the, the Treasury CRA website is kind of a hub for all information on the Community Reinvestment Act. Um, reach out to see uh, if your organization is interested in being involved in this, uh, reach out to us and let us know. The Community Reinvestment Act, uh, you know, it, it, it is a statutory uh, law, uh, so it has the power of law and it requires banks that take deposits and otherwise profit from neighborhoods to also reinvest in those neighborhoods. And this is critical in places, let's talk about Marceline in Baltimore in the Black Butterfly. Large black neighborhoods in West and East Baltimore uh, contribute a lot of money that goes into bank deposits in one way or the other, yet they get very little back for it. So the, the goal of CRA is to encourage investment in those communities and it, it, we do know it does so, we've done some work looking at, uh, and the Federal Reserve has done some good work looking at the impact of CRA. And it does appear that in low to moderate income neighborhoods, it does encourage more investment when CRA uh, goes away for one reason or another, a lot of that investment dries up. Um, but uh, you know, expanding and reinforcing the value of CRA is one way that we feel that we can, we can break some of these patterns um, but uh, but but there are other challenges. Does anybody else want to hop in and try to kind of answer either of those questions? I'll jump in briefly. Um, I agree with everything that Jason said about CRA. It's a critically important fight. I would also say um, I would suggest people really look at what is happening at their state and local level. One of the things that we see is that um, it takes some time no matter what the situation is to move things forward at the federal level, critically important work. But a lot of times whatever happens can serve as the floor and states can go above and beyond what is happening at the federal level. So, you know, right now in Maryland, we're working on a number of policies that are gonna come before our general assembly, looking at things like um, ways at the state level to support fair housing more deeply, looking at, for example, ways to um, get rid of fines and fees that are predatory on low income and predominantly black residents. And the good thing about state work is you can often get it done within three to six months. So um, you don't need as many people to be involved, but you need people to be involved at the state and local level. And then I'd say, Rui mentioned the CFPB and we'll see what will happen post November. But prior to this administration, the CFPB played critically important roles in terms of expanding protections for um, older adults, students, um, protecting people from debt collection and putting in place housing protections, almost all of which have been undone and unwound. But I think you know it, there's a possibility certainly going forward that there'll be important work that can happen there um, and we'll know more um, after November. So um, I'll um, speak very briefly because there are, you know, there's so many financial products and there are um, so many, you know, so one of the ways that is clear to me um, is that when you've got, you know, certain intersectionalities of race, poverty, age, socioeconomic status, et cetera, when, and this is, I'm learning, so unpacking some of this with the women who are actually serving some of these young women is when, when the person delivering the services doesn't look like the person who's receiving the services. Like if I were to go into the, you know, I've been probably an interest lawyer for 40 years, right? I go into, you know, a, 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 you know, a black neighborhood working with, teen, with young teens. And I'm like, I want you to graduate high school. I want you to get a living wage job. I want you to then, you know, essentially be able to afford uh, uh, buy a house, you know, it's like, I'm not, what am I going to say? I'm going to say, oh, I did it. And you, so can you, but there are people who can't say that. And they can talk about the choices they made to delay pregnancy to, you know, essentially not just take the first job at, you know, at a minimum wage, but to make the choices you have to make to get. So, so one of the things that we're discovering, uh, and it's, you know, it's figuring it out is there are certain young people who won't go into some of the not-for-profits where the services are being provided. You know, and again, I don't want to, you know, go, we'll, some of this will be written up actually, even later today, the website is still not live, we're revising. So it's, it's essentially 
when I say, so it's like, it's, it's experience based, right? I mean, and that's just serving and, you know, very basic. Then you go to so many other things like, you know, and I don't, I don't. So when we did the too big to fail report, we did a focus group. We did a lot of research of a lot of reading and we're like, okay, how are we going to get, you know, one of the things I need to do is try and make, it's very, it's very, very hard for good white liberal people to understand why when they are being good white liberal people, people don't want to talk to them. What's happened in Rochester and actually in Baltimore with the murders that we've seen, it, it's, it's real, people get very angry with me, you know, and, and this has happened to me. You know, when I've tried to support someone from my intersectionality, which is South Asian speaking Urdu Hindi, you know, someone who was really, really traumatized and he wouldn't, I couldn't get him to talk to anyone who wasn't South Asian and didn't speak his language. And people don't wanna hear that, you know, you've so, so I've been trying to explain. And so the, the in a sense, the trauma that is on our streets every day, is, it's, it's easier for me to explain to a white banker why, you know, why people aren't walking in the door and why they went to household and beneficial. Remember, remember what happens in, su in the subprime crisis. People take their CRA loans, their fixed 30 year loans, and they walk into neighborhoods or people come to their door who look like them and they refinance them. Why do they go, if you read Professor Lisa Sirwan who worked in a, you know, in a, a check cashier and in a, in, in a payday lender. And it's like, you know, we're gonna rip you off and make you feel really good ripping you off. Whereas the banks, well, all right, we'll lend you some money, but you know, you're full of ass and, you know, we're gonna make you feel really bad and we're gonna make you feel horrible. And then maybe if, you know, we decide to, we'll lend you money. So like, it's, it's like, it's, it's like, I'm at the point where, I mean, it's COVID anyways, but like someone like me with a lot of privilege, you know, went to a fancy law school, blah, blah, blah. I do not walk, wanna walk into a space where someone's gonna look at me and assume I can't afford to buy a not very expensive skirt or dress. I mean, this is something that it's my trauma that happens every couple of years when I have to buy something new to go to a meeting or something like that. And and I, I just, and so someone like me who's experiencing racism, you know, not very, very little. And, you know, I have young adult kids now who are also experiencing racism. You know, we're South Asian, we're, I was born Muslim, they have Muslim names. So they're all the whole, post 9-11 terrorist stuff happens. So, so it's really, and so it's really, really hard to explain why, you know, I'm a good bank. I'm a good banker. I'm really doing and saying the right things. And, you know, there are very, very few white people now. Jesse Van Tol actually is one of them. He has been my rock. I know he's not on, but he's the one person I turn to when I'm about to lose, tear my hair out. Um, there are very few. And so, it's we're trying to see it. we've got CEOs doing anti-oppression training and but it'll take them years and years not to do the right thing to learn how to do the right thing so you know it's um it's 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 for for us in Rochester good white people think I'm the white savior and I'm sorry I know this is really offensive uh you know I've got to stop folk being the white savior and get rid of their white savior complex and explain why we need black and Latinx run organizations or people with power. I mean, it doesn't, you know, it's very hard to find black and Latinx CEOs. I mean, whatever, I don't know. We, we've, we've, we don't have any black and Latinx attorneys pretty much. I'm sorry, I should rephrase that. It's like, anyway, it's complicated with Latinx. Thanks, so. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna stop because he's we got about a minute or so left. There, okay. there are still some great questions in the chat that I wasn't able to um, to really get to uh, now. But um, I, I think we've posted all of the contact information in the chat as well. If you uh, if you have further questions or we weren't able to get to yours, I apologize. Uh, just shoot an email to us. And if you're not sh sure of somebody's contact information, you can contact me. Uh, there's the report. Um, so Jason, mm -hmm. we have to attack the banks who who don't do the work good lending themselves and fund the bad payday lenders and the bad. So that was a question that came up. Yes, that uh, we got to stop that. We got to, you know, we've been fighting it for years, but we got to stop that too. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, there's a link on the screen to the report as well. You can click there and read uh, the stories that Ruhi and Marceline have written for us. And we're going to be publishing still a few more of those are coming out over the next several weeks. 
So check it out. If you have any questions at all, please let me know at jrichardson at ncrc.org. With that, I'm going to go ahead and shut it down. Thanks, everybody, for attending. And thanks to our great presenters for giving us their time. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you.